So shall we pray? Our oh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for this uh, power that uh, you have uh, allowed us to be in your presence once again and uh, be able to share your word. We, we thank you for even the blessings of the rain and how we pray that, uh, Lord, it may rain at its right time that uh, we may be able to share together. And so guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, uh, welcome once again to uh, number five in the series, uh, Minneapolis 1888. And um, yesterday uh, presentation, we were looking at uh, uh, the basis of our salvation after seeing that um, there was some clash between uh, Ray Smith and uh, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner uh, on uh, how they viewed the basis of our uh, uh, our salvation and acceptance in judgment. And we want to just continue because um, we left at some point where uh, we saw the last slide on uh, our presentation. Uh, the last slide on our presentation, we want to just pick from where we left in number four. The presentation is with the message accepted. But then we left at this slide the reaction of uh, his listeners, that is E.J. Wagon in the Minneapolis uh, 1888 one. Some accepted the message and supported Wagon, E.G. White, Willie White, Haskell, and Will Wilcox, ETC. And uh, we have another group, some rejected the message, that is Uriah Smith, J.H. Morrison, Conradi, and the, uh, others. And then we have the third group, which was the majority was undecided. They did not know what to believe. Now, this was, um, number three was the most uh, outstanding uh, 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 group that we can speak about because here were the delegate, delegates gathered to go back and uh, tell the church what the Lord had uh, brought through his messengers, but they were undecided what to go and uh, tell the church. And so you can see that there is no way the message could have been spread all over the four corners of the world while the majority of the people or the majority of the delegates didn't know what even to tell their congregation. And so uh, was the message accepted or was mes the message rejected? That is what we want to look into. And uh, just going through uh, some of these things, uh, we shall see if uh, the message was accepted or uh, the message was um, re rejected. And then uh, we shall enter into a very, very important uh, 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 issue. Why even the message of righteousness by faith was brought by Wagona and uh, Jones, and why the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ was set forth, and it was called a message uh, with the uh, divine credentials. Why was it necessary for the picture, the divine picture of Jesus Christ to be set before the people? Now, uh, was the message accepted or rejected? That is what I want to deal with in uh, uh, some few minutes or so. Reading in uh, uh, reading in uh, 1888 materials, um, page uh, 229, we read that, uh, and I saw that the hearts with which I longed to be in harmony were padlocked by prejudice and unbelief. I thought best for me to leave them my purpose was to go from Minneapolis the first of the week. Brother Kim Go came with a request that I should speak the next day. But I said, no, my brother, I can say nothing that many of my ministering brethren consider to be of any value to them. I must not work and exhaust my strength needlessly. I must go away and see what the Lord has for me to do elsewhere, for I know I have a message to bear to his people. And so from after one week, E.G. White was ready to leave Minneapolis because the hearts of the people who were attending the meeting were padlocked with prejudice. And she was to leave and not come again until uh, Elder Kilgo came to her and told her to stay. But then she said that uh, if these people can't accept the message, then it is good that we go to the people direct instead of giving to the delegates. And then uh, they do not reach to the people. Talking about... Uh, wanting to leave uh, Minneapolis, 
this is what uh, again she had to say uh, when uh, the messages were ridiculed uh, that if people can't accept the message, then it is good that uh, it goes to the people. Looking in uh, looking in, in in that session in uh, 1888 material, page 152, paragraph 6, she says this concerning the meeting after two weeks. Um, we read on uh, in uh, 1888 materials, page um, 152, paragraph 6. She says, when I have been made to pass over the history of the Jewish nation and have seen where they stumbled because they did not walk in the light, I have been led to realize where we as a people would be led if we refuse the light God would give us. Eyes have ye, but ye see not, ears, but ye hear not. Now, brethren, light has come to us and we want to be where we can grasp it. And God will lead us out one by one to him. I see your danger and I want to warn you. He says, now this is the last minister's meeting we will have unless you wish to meet together yourselves. If the ministers will not receive the light, I want to give the people a chance. Perhaps they may receive it. God did not raise me up to come across the plains to speak to you and you sit here to question his message and question whether Sister White is the same as she used to be in years gone by. I have in many things gone way back and given you that which was given me in years past because then you acknowledge that Sister White was right. But somehow it has changed now and Sister White is different just like the Jewish nation. And so after two weeks, this is what she is saying that hearts are padlocked with prejudice. And if these ministers are not going to change how they view things and how they accept things, then it was a chance that she went to the people directly instead of them having a general conference or a ministerial institute to address the delegates from um, different parts of the world. And so you can start sending the tenor. Was the message accepted? Was the message rejected? And what was the aftermath of uh, Minneapolis 18? 88. Continued on, uh, she continues to say, uh, for me to stand ready to advise and counsel my brethren who have no faith in my judgment and counsel will be a waste of time and strength. Let me labor with those who have not been le leavened with prejudice and unbelief and who have not taken decided positions to make of none effect my words, which I know are given me of God for their benefit. The Lord's work is not to be trifled with it is not year and nigh, but year and amen in Christ Jesus. I wish not to subject myself to any such an experience as I had at Minneapolis, unless the Lord shall signify to me that it is my duty. I have not changed in ideas or spirit since then. Have you changed? If so, please let me know. I know not what testimony the Lord may give me for you, and I should have to speak the word the Lord will give me for I am not my own, I am under the control of my master, Jesus Christ. The words he gave me to speak at Minneapolis, I shall speak, whether it pleases or displeases. Frequently, I do not anticipate saying the things I do say when I am speaking before the people. And so you can send that, uh, actually there are some urgency in her speech and uh, in her, uh, uh, her words, and even she goes ahead to say that the work that I'm now speaking to you, I'll not dare speak to the people. It means that uh, the way that the confrontation was and uh, her reaction to how they were uh, actually uh, 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 accepting or uh, uh, perceiving the messages was something that really concerned her. And she knew if she had a chance to speak to the people directly, the way they will react is different from where, uh, how the delegates in Minneapolis will uh, 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 respond or react. And then her speech to the people will be more different to the speech that she has for the delegates and the ministers at uh, Minneapolis. Continued on, she says, still in 1888-254.1, God may give me words of reproof, of warning or encouragement as he sees fit. For the benefit of souls. I shall speak these words and they may cut across the track of my brethren whom I sincerely love and respect in the truth. To have this word distorted, misapprehended by unbelievers, I expect 
and it is no surprise to me but to have my brethren who are acquainted with my mission and my work threefold the message that God gives me to bear grieves his spirit and it is discouraging to me to have them pick out portions that please them in their testimonies which they construe to justify their own course of action and give the impression that that portion they accept as the voice of God and then when other testimonies come that bring rebuke upon their course when words are spoken that do not coincide with their opinions and judgment they dishonor God's work by saying oh this we do not accept it is only Sister White's opinion, and it's no better than my opinion or that of anyone else. This is dishonoring to God and grieves to his and grievous to his spirit. And so the, the real problem that also developed in um, 1888, uh, the General Conference and Ministerial Institute, is that uh, people started cherry-picking the testimonies. They could say that this was inspired, this was not inspired. And um, some of the things that didn't agree with them, they say that, oh, Willie White has influenced Sister White, uh, or uh, E.J. Wagoner, or A.T. Jones, or even Professor Prescott, they have influenced uh, E.J. White because she came from, uh, I think, the East Coast, uh, where they were, uh, these brethren were also laboring. And so coming from where they came from and um, coming to the general conference uh, session, the people had this idea that she had been influenced by these brethren who are carrying the message of uh, righteousness by faith. And so they could say, this one we agree with it, but this one is the influence of this and this person because uh, as we saw, they had some prejudice against uh, A.T. Jones and uh, uh, brother E.J. Wagner. And also they came to have a, pr a problem with uh, Willie White because... Uh, uh, Willie White uh, believed in thought inspiration and not uh, verbal inspiration, and there were uh, there were delegates and the minist ministers who actually did not agree on this issue so far. What kind of inspiration the prophets have, and how can they take their words? Now, in 1888 materials, page 152, paragraph 6, uh, paragraph 5 and paragraph 6, looking at what the message rejected, was the message accepted or rejected? She says, when I have been made to pass over the history of the Jewish nation and have seen where they stumbled because they did not walk in the light, I have been made to realize where we as a people will be led if we refuse the light God will give us. Eyes have ye, but ye see not, ears, but ye hear not. Now brethren, light has come to us and we want to be where we can grasp it. And so even though that um, they were in the midst of the messengers who had the message from the Lord, they could not grasp the light that uh, the Lord was bringing to the church. No wonder she says that uh, even in the return of the latter rain, we may be amongst the people, we may be among in the midst of the congregation where God is ministering his latter rain, but it may be falling, but not falling on us because there is a way we want things to come out. There is a way we have been uh, trained to think and condition to view things and uh, when the light of the fourth angel of revelation 18 comes many will not comprehend it and they will term it, term it as fanatism and what were these brethren calling fanatism in 1888 i just want to backtrack a little bit and um, bring you to a place where what what they were talking about um uh how how, how they were viewing this message because she says when the Fourth angel's uh, uh, message returns, many will not comprehend it because they'll call it fanatism. Now, the brethren in Minneapolis 1888 General Conference, when the message of righteousness by faith was presented, this is what they had to say in the 1888 material, page 560, paragraph 4. Uh, and this is saddening to read such a things that those who had been in truth for more than 40 years who think such a things is really something that is disturbing. They said this, uh, Sister White addressing them, brethren, shall we not all of us leave our lords here? That is our luggages and our burdens and all that stuff. And when we leave this meeting, may it be with the truth burning in our souls like fire shut up in our bones. You will meet. Now, now she says, she talks about the brethren, what they were speaking about, the message of righteousness by faith as it was brought by E.J. Wagoner and uh, A.T. Jones. You will meet with those who will say, you are too much excited over this matter. You are too much in earnest. 
you should not be reaching for the righteousness of Christ and making so much of that. You should preach the law. And so uh, one of the problems that uh, the Minneapolis conference had is that uh, the old pioneers, because E.J. Wagona and uh, A.T. Jones were not pioneers, we had the old pioneers and uh, we had the people who started the movement like uh, Hiram Edison, uh, Father Bates, and uh, we had, um, uh, who else? We had uh, James White, we had uh, Uriah Smith coming in, but we had people like uh, John uh, Loboro and uh, Jane Andrews. Th these are the people who are called pioneers who started the movement and uh, uh, the first president there. So this brethren was saying that um, people are so honest with this issue of uh, Christ and his righteousness, they should preach the law. But uh, Sister White had said, we as a people have preached the law until we have become as dry as the hills of Gilboa. We need to preach Christ in the law. And so uh, when the fourth angel's message actually returns, it will not be comprehended because people, the way they view things and the way they want, uh, 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 they, they, they want the message to be preached and whomsoever they want it to be preached to is, does not come uh, uh, as they wish, but uh, we are told that the Lord will do what he wants to do on his own terms and not the terms of the people. And so they say, do not be so honest. And so she says that uh, we want to be where we can grasp the light. Why does she say that we want to be where we can grasp the light? Because people are there, the message was being preached, but none was receiving it as the light from heaven because they had been used to uh, some certain ways of uh, uh, thinking and viewing things. And uh, just continue on in uh, looking at, uh, this is letter 2, 1892 to uh, Elder Olson, writing to Elder Olson in letter 2, 1892. Uh, this is uh, what uh, she says about uh, the proceeding of the meeting. She had earlier said that uh, she wished after two weeks to leave, but Elder Kilgo uh, 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 approached her not to leave. And then after some time again, she had this to say uh, in uh, letter 2A, uh, recording uh, of what transpired in the meeting, 1892, to Elder Olson. At one stage, E.G. White was so discouraged she wanted to leave, but the angel of the Lord told her, not so, God has a work for you to do in this place. The people are acting over the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. So 1888 is likened to the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who wanted to lead back the children of uh, Israel to Egypt instead of marching into the promised land. And so the hearts of 1888 was not to advance in the light that the Lord had for the church, but to remain where they were and even uh, try to guard what they, uh, they, they termed as the old landmarks, which Sister White says that these uh, are, 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 are talking about the landmarks and the, and the pillars of, of the faith. I do not remember such a things that uh, people talk about. So she says that uh, the angel told her not so you have a work here to do. In 1888-309.2, she says, I could but have a vivid, vivid picture in my mind from day to day of the way reformers were treated. How slight difference of opinion seemed to create a frenzy of feeling. Thus it was in the betrayal, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus. All this had passed before me point by point. And in which meeting? in 1888 meeting. What, what does this mean is this, that um, the way the Jewish people behaved with Jesus Christ is the same way the delegates and the ministers were behaving with the messengers of light in 1888. And so history repeats itself and there is nothing new under the sun and the Lord requires of the past. The what has been is what shall be. And we have to ask ourselves, in which way are we fulfilling prophecy? Is it in the positive way? Or in the negative way. She continues to say, the satanic spirit took control and moved with power upon the human hearts that have been open to doubts and to bitterness, wrath and hatred. All this was prevailing in that meeting. I decided to leave the meeting, leave Minneapolis. 
I refused to speak again to our people, but consented to speak to Scandinavians. Now, this is a very amazing that um, as she is likening the betrayal, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus Christ, where actually just prior to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he left speaking to the Jewish people and went and spoke to the Greeks and then said that the Son of Man is now glorified in that the Gentiles were accepting the message than the Jewish people who were taught to be first to accept the message and then carry it to the whole world. So in 1888, the very people who were to accept the message and take it to the whole world were refusing it. And so she decided, I have no time for the people who have been in truth for so long and they can't accept the message. I'll go to the Scandinavians and speak to them. Just the same scenario of the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his betrayal. That is what was happening in 1888. And so the question is, was the message accepted? Or was it rejected? And as we read on, you can make your own conclusion because truth cannot be forced on the mind and everyone has an opinion and everyone has a decision to make according to the facts that uh, has been supplied. 1888, page 240, paragraph 1. But before I read this about uh, laboring uh, at Minneapolis, I'd like to bring something about uh, the history of the Jewish and how it will play out uh, before just the coming of Jesus Christ. This is uh, in uh, 1 uh, Sam, uh, 1 Sam, and uh, this is page 406, paragraph 1. The, that was that which was in uh, the trial, the crucifixion and the betrayal of Jesus Christ, that which happened with the Jewish people at the first coming of Jesus Christ, that which happened in 1888 and what is happening as we speak right now. She has this to say uh, concerning the history. We want to understand the time in which we live. We do not have understand it. We do not have take it in. My heart trembles in me when I think of what for we have to meet and how poorly we are prepared to meet him. The trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ have been presented before me again and again to illustrate the position of the people of God in their experience before the second coming of Christ. How the enemy sought every occasion to take control of the minds of the Jewish, and today he is seeking to blind the minds of, of God's servant that they may not be able to discern the precious truth. Now, you don't have to uh, wonder what is this precious truth she's saying, uh, she's talking about, because in uh, LDE, uh, in LDE, this is, uh, this is what she said in LDE, page, um, this is uh, LDE page, um, page 200, paragraph 1. First of all, starting from 199.4 to 200.1, uh, she says, Talking about what was the precious message he was talking about that uh, the Jewish refused and then Minneapolis refused and then just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ, people will refuse. What is the precious message? He says in LDE 199.4, several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered it is the third angel's message in verity. The Lord in his great mercy send a most precious message to his people through elders E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is man made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. So the precious message he's talking about is receiving the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, was um, the third angel's message preached to the Jewish so that she may say that they rejected the precious message? What was the core message of Jesus Christ during her, his first coming? The kingdom is within you. That is, the kingdom of God had to be established in their hearts first before it could be set as a literal kingdom in their land. But what they refused is to accept Christ to establish that kingdom in their heart. And so their hearts were also padlocked. They could not accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Now, accepting Jesus Christ as the Son of God has a lot of implications, meaning that um, you will have the seed 
uh, of Christ in you, you will have the same one who has the divinity of the Lord and he's able to give you his life. The, the Jewish people uh, thought that the temple was the much more important thing than the one who was in the temple. They could protect the temple, but they could not protect the one who was in the temple. And so they rejected Jesus Christ. And we are told in John 14, 6, that there is no way truth and life to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And this is what they refused. Now, why should we receive Jesus Christ? The reason why we should receive Jesus Christ is so that he may impart his spirit upon us, that through this spirit, which Hebrews 9, 14 says is eternal spirit, it may be able to give us victory over sin and present us before the Father in a spotless way. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Why should we accept Jesus Christ? So that he may give us his spirit. And what does his spirit do? The book of uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And so the message of justification by faith was to enable people to obey the commandments of God by the righteousness of Jesus Christ within, not the righteousness without. Uh, because the righteousness without, if it, it's not given by Jesus Christ from within, then we may have a legalistic way of uh, accepting salvation and not uh, 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 the real article of justification by faith. And so when they rejected Jesus Christ, they rejected the eternal spirit, which is able to present them before the Father without the spot. And Christ is coming for a church which is spotless. And anyone who doesn't receive his spirit then cannot be spotless. He cannot receive the fruit of the spirit, which can reproduce uh, uh, the experience of justification, which is sanctification, actually. And so these people, uh, this most precious message has been rejected time and time again. Now, when you come to 1888, was it rejected or was it accepted? She repeats the same thing that what happened at the first coming is what happened at Minneapolis, and it will be there during just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so, she continues to say in 1888 material, page 240, paragraph 1, My brother, how can I hope to labor in harmony with you when Minneapolis, with its experiences, is so plainly before me? My ministering brethren came to that conference with a spirit that was not the spirit of God. They were under a deception in regard to me. If the spirit of God had impressed and controlled their hearts, they would not have taken a position so wide off the mark in judging me, my position position and work. And so the spirit that existed in Minneapolis was opposite of the work, the position of Ellen White. And if it was opposite to that, and then E.G. White had accepted the message through Wagner and Jones, then it means that uh, the opposite is a rejection of it because the other opposite is the acceptance of it and it was uh, not the case. After plainly stating my position, I said that as long as my brethren thought that I was influenced in my judgment and work by Willie White, Etty Jones, or Dr. Wagoner, they need not send for me to attend their camp meetings or conferences, for I could do them no good if I did come. And so there's a statement. She says that now I must do the work that I have been appointed to do. I'll not come to your conferences because... When I come, after leaving them, I'm sick for several weeks, and uh, I'll do my writing. And uh, in 1889, uh, in Review and Herald, March 5, writing to Elder Olson, again she says, I have never seen a revival work go forward with such a thoroughness, and yet remain so free from all undue excitement. And so uh, here was a thorough work going on by uh, Jones, Wagner, and Prescott, but there was excitement and passion and fanaticism that carried uh, 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 the conference session that uh, was not a godly uh, excitement. And so uh, we can be sure that that meeting had also it is uh, negativities that uh, were being exhibited by the people who were attending it. 
So some say the church as a whole rejected the message of Minneapolis and called for corporate repentance. And um, you can read uh, Corporate Repentance by um, Robert J. Wieland, a plea of the true witness. And uh, going, the, going through the, this uh, issue of corporate repentance, plea of the true witness, we are brought to the book of uh, Daniel chapter 9. And let us just read a section of it and see what Daniel chapter 9 is all about. Going to Daniel chapter 9, uh, this is what we read. From verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Verse 3, and I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and say, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned. I want us to notice the word, we have sinned. And this is Daniel actually taking the sins of Israel as his own sins and incorporating himself in the sins that he had not committed. Because we are told that there was no blemish in the child or in the, in, in the man, Daniel himself. Because when you continue reading in Daniel chapter 9, angel Gabriel say, comes and says, Thou beloved of God. Now we know that God does not love or does not communicate in visions and dreams to those people who are working against him. And so... Daniel, we can be sure that he was a man beloved of God because he never uh, swayed from the principle of uh, Christian integrity. Even when the children of Israel were threatened with uh, uh, the, the, the fire in the furnace, the den of lions, he stood uh, to his feet. And uh, 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 such a man is what uh, uh, Christ wants men, minute men who will stand for truth, whether heaven and uh, earth fall. So we notice the word we, he including himself in, talking about corporate repentance that uh, Robert Willand is talking about, uh, he says that uh, we need to consider the prayer of Daniel, and that, that is Daniel chapter 9, that uh, even though we have not participated in a sin, but because the people who call themselves the children of God are sinning, we need to own those sins as our sins and do what? Participate in repenting peradventure that the Lord may live a blessing to the people. We have sinned and have committed iniquity, verse 5, and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from the precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. It is very uh, 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 mysterious and uh, uh, Something to just think about that uh, Daniel says that uh, all Lord righteousness belongeth to thee. Talking about uh, uh, the whole prayer of Daniel, it was about the children of God, the children of Israel accepting the righteousness of God. How was this about the righteousness of God? Remember Daniel chapter 8 verse 13 and 14, the, uh, uh, the wonderful number says that unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now, the cleansing of the sanctuary, first of all, uh, uh, when we, we jump some uh, pages, some verses and go to verse 24, we are told that uh, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to do what? First, finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision of prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, the vision of the prophecy is Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, and the six pointers is what they had to do. Finish up sin, iniquity, transgression, and seal up the everlasting righteousness. This is what was wanted in the cleansing up of the sanctuary. So, when Daniel is praying, he prays, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day to the men of Judah, who are the remnant, because when Israel split, we had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, 
and Judah composed uh, the southern kingdom. And so Judah was deemed as the remnant of Israel, and here he is pleading. It is only confusion in Judah. Israel had wandered away from the truth long time ago, and Judah was remaining, but what is remaining again, it is only in confusion. When you look at Seventh-day Adventists in 1888, that is what actually was considered a remnant, but only confusion reigned. Today, what is considered a remnant also, it is full of confusion, disorderliness, and all these things that Israel was in. Daniel prays, owning the sins of the people, he continues praying that, Lord, have mercy upon thy people. To the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. Have mercy upon us. This is the prayer of Daniel. And so Robert Whelan, revisiting 1888, he says that uh, it is a time that uh, we must have a corporate repentance. On up the prayer of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. If we will have the sanctuary cleansed, we should start praying like Daniel was praying in Daniel chapter 9. For adventure, God can cleanse his sanctuary and bring a blessing upon his people. And so, some say this church as a whole rejected the message of Minneapolis and called for corporate repentance, plea of the true witness. And uh, the Exodus and Advent movements in type and anti-type by uh, Taylor G. Bunch. And uh, you can uh, remember Taylor G. Bunch is the one who wrote the book, uh, Behold the Man. It is a, a masterclass. You can read it, Behold the Man, where actually she goes through all how the Sanhedrin broke all the laws, not only of God, by their, but their own more, um, uh, oral laws. Uh, when dealing with Jesus Christ. Everything that they had written in Gemara, the Mishnah, and uh, the Talgum, which was their oral law, they broke all of it, and also they broke all the law of the Bible when it came to dealing with Jesus Christ. And uh, in type and anti-type, Taylor Band goes to the Exodus Advent movements in type and anti-type is something that you can go ahead and read. She says that... Uh, Minneapolis was another journey in the wilderness from Egypt to the promised land. And he is right in saying so because, look, um, we are told that it was 11 days to travel from Kadesh Barnea to the land uh, of promise, uh, only 11 days, but it took the people 40 years to travel through that. And in 1888, Haskell and uh, the prophetess says that if the message could have been accepted only two years, the world could have been warned, and then the Lord would have come. But 1888, two years, takes us to 1890, but here 177 years, we are still here, not, not, even, 140, not even 40 years, but 170 years. And, you know, this even becomes more worse than uh, the children of Israel in the wilderness, because in the wilderness, it only takes 40 years, but we have taken here almost 170 plus years. So Taylor Bunch in type and anti-type says he equates Minneapolis experience as of advancing with the Kaddish Barnea experience of ancient Israel. When they just were at the brink of entering into the promised land, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and we have been here for all these years. The question that he asked is this, if the message was accepted, why are the people still here? Because there is no way the, way the message can be accepted. We are told that if the message could have been accepted, the Lord will have outpoured his Holy Spirit upon the church, and then the loud cry could have been sounded, the church could have been made ready, and then Christ would have come. But the fact that we are here, Taylor Bunch argues that uh, there is no way people can say the message was accepted, or now the message has been accepted, and yet we be still here. Lateran is not falling and there is no loud cry. It is something to, uh, it's a book that um, you can go ahead and read. And so Telaban says, in Numbers 13, 26, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Numbers 32, verse 8, thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. 
the people rebelled just 11 days to the land of Canaan and were forced to spend 40 years in the wilderness. And then a Jew white uh, uh, continues to say in 1888 material 764.9, there is a lack of moral and spiritual power throughout our conferences. Many churches do not have light in themselves. The members do not give evidence that they are branches of the true vine by bearing much fruit to the glory of God, but appear to be withering away. Their Redeemer has withdrawn his light, the inspiration of his Holy Spirit from their assemblies, for they have ceased to represent the self-denial, the sympathy and compassionate love of the world's Redeemer. They have not love for the souls for whom Christ has died. They have ceased to be true and faithful. It is a sad picture, the feeble piety, the one of consecration and devotion to God. There has been a separation of the soul from God. Many have cut off the communication between him and the soul by refusing his messengers and his messages. Now, it is interesting, the quote that uh, one true God believers also like to quote, and uh, it is connected to 1888 messages. This is uh, a quote that uh, we uh, love to quote so much. Uh, uh, the reason why uh, the churches are ready to die. What is the reason? We are told in uh, in uh, Revealed Herald, August 26, 1890, paragraph 10, and uh, I'll share it on the screen. Here is what we are told in connection with the, the righteousness of Christ's message. The reason why the churches are weak and sickly and ready to die is that the enemy has brought influences of discouraging nature to bear upon trembling souls. He has sought to shut Jesus from their view as the comforter, as one who reproves, who warns, who admonishes them, saying, this is the way walk ye in it. Christ has all power in heaven and on, in earth, and he can strengthen the wavering and set aright the erring. He can inspire with confidence, with hope in God, and confidence in God always results in creating confidence in one another. So Minneapolis was lacking confidence one in another, trust, and all that was there, people were going against the reproofs. And so Jesus Christ as the comforter was shut out of the conference in that session. Now, we love to say that uh, 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 the reason why uh, the churches are red, sickly and ready to die is because uh, they have shut out the comforter who is Jesus Christ and accepted God, the Holy Spirit. But this quote is directed to one true God believers. It was not directed to, non -trin uh, to, trin to Trinitarians. This is a quote that is directed to non-Trinitarians, but we love to quote it in connection with people who are Trinitarians saying that there is God, the Holy Spirit. And so we say, you see, you are saying that there is God, the Holy Spirit, who is not Jesus Christ. And so the churches are sickly and ready to die because the comforter is Jesus Christ, but you are saying the comforter is God, the Holy Spirit. Now, leave alone these issues that we like to quote, to cherry pick some quotes somewhere and uh, place them where they are not supposed to be placed. Here is the quote placed on the message of righteousness by faith in what happens to the churches that in Minneapolis conference, the people refuse the messengers and the message. And now the churches are weak and sickly and are ready to die. Reason, these non-Trinitarians have shut out Jesus Christ as their comforter in their hearts. And so, uh, you know, when uh, there is uh, a moat in somebody's eyes, you see it as a log, but uh, when it is in you, you don't see it. And this is the quote that is written to us, those who profess to believe in one true God, that actually in reality, we have shut out Jesus Christ as the comforter. In which way? Because we have rejected the messengers and the message itself. That is the message, the precious message of uh, uh, righteousness uh, by faith. Continued on as uh, we try to wrap up this presentation, uh, uh, as we have read, is that uh, uh, there has been a separation of the soul from God. Many have cut off the communication between him and the soul by refusing his messengers and his messages. Again, in 518, uh, same book, we read, 
there is a bracing of the mind and opposition of the soul brought to the investigation of the scriptures. This leaves such a soul where Satan can impress them. In Minneapolis, God gave precious gems of truth to his picture to his people in new settings. So Minneapolis, there was no new message. It was the old message put to the people in a new setting. What was this new setting? People had been preaching the law and uh, partially receiving the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But now when it came, the same, same message, but in a new setting, we are told, Minneapolis, the precious gems were rejected. This light from heaven by some was rejected with all the stubbornness the Jewish manifested in rejecting Jesus Christ. Now you have the exact words of the prophetess saying, the message was rejected. You don't need again for somebody to tell you that uh, Minneapolis, the message was accepted or refused. You just have to go through the materials of 1888 and find the answer by yourself. This light from heaven by some was rejected with all the stubbornness the Jewish manifested in rejecting Christ. And there was much talk about standing by the old landmarks, but there was evidence that they knew not what the old landmarks were. There were evidence that there was reasoning from the word that commended itself to the conscience, but the minds of men were fixed, sealed against the entrance of light, because they had decided it was a dangerous error removing the old landmarks when it was move, not moving a peg of the old landmarks. But they had perverted ideas of what constituted the old landmarks. Now, this is a strange statement from E.G. White that uh, the delegates in Minneapolis, more so the ministers, the leading ministers like Uriah Smith, G.I. Butler, Elder Kilgo, Elder Morrison, that they didn't know what the old landmarks were. These people who had been in, who had been in truth for 40 plus years, or let us say for 30 plus years, not 40 plus years, 30 plus years, they didn't know what the old landmarks were, yet they were crying, uh, stand by the old landmarks. And what was this stand by the old landmarks, by the way? Was it not uh, the, the contention between uh, Elder Smith and uh, E.J. Wagner about uh, the law in Galatians, where actually... They thought that the old landmark was that the law in Galatians is the ceremonial law. But now here is E.J. Wagner saying that the law in Galatians is the moral law. And Sister White supporting that it especially speaks about the moral law. And so they were saying that stand by the old landmarks. But she says that they didn't know what the old landmarks were. What uh, a rebuke to the people who had been in truth for so long. In 1888, material page 934, paragraph 4, the Review and Herald Office is not in a right position before God. The Lord requires that every one of the servants do his bidding, but there is a great neglect of this. The atmosphere in the Review Office is not helpful. The managers are not fervent in spirit serving the Lord. While they profess to believe the Bible, they fail in practicing its teachings. They are hearers but not doers of the word. The heavenly graces are not in the heart, and woven into the character. The requirement is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, 6, 33. The truth as it is in Jesus will lead men to make Christ first and the world second. They will not engage in the sacred work of God without most earnestly seeking heavenly direction because Christ has said, without me you can do nothing. And what was wrong with the, the revealed herald that she had to write in 1888 messages? Remember, here is um, Wagner and Jonas. They have the articles in the Science of the Time about the law in Galatians and the message of righteousness by faith, connecting the book of Galatians with the book of Romans and the book of Acts chapter 15. And um, Uriah Smith goes ahead and publishes the articles of these brethren without telling them even a single word. And then he comes to the Review and Herald and places another article uh, by G.I. Butler and uh, other brethren, which is in direct opposition with what he had uh, re, uh, printed, uh, written earlier or printed earlier in the Science of the Time. And so one of the brothers who was attending the Minneapolis conference came to E.G. White and said that uh, he is so confused now what to believe. Here is an article in Science of the Time and here is an article in Review and Herald and they are in opposition. What shall we people believe? as the delegates in this con in this uh, uh, session. And uh, this brought about Sister White writing that uh, those working in the review office, they are not right with God. For how will you accept an article from a brother 
print it and send it to the world. And in the other paper, you write something so opposite. What are you trying to create to the people who will be reading such a messages? And so she asked for repentance from these people that they may be purified. And uh, to Elder Smith, this is uh, what she had to say. We have like five slides. Uh, to Elder Smith, uh, he had to tell him this, who was in charge of the review and the herald. Do not labor so hard to do the very work Satan is doing. This work was done in Minneapolis. Satan triumphed. This work has been done here. So if Satan triumphed in Minneapolis, was the message rejected or was the message accepted? When Satan triumphs in anything, is the message of God being accepted or rejected? That one you can fill in the blanks. Night before last, I was shown that evidence in regard to the covenants was clear and convincing. Yourself, Brother Dan Jones, Brother Porter, and others are spending your investigation powers for naught to produce a position on the covenants to vary from the position that Brother Wagner has presented. When you had received the true light which shineth, you will not have imitated or gone over the same manner of interpretation and miscontrolling the scripture as did the Jewish. What made them so zealous? Why did they hang on the words of Christ? Why did spies follow him to mark his words that they could repeat and misinterpret and twist in way to mean that which their own unsanctified minds would make them to mean? In this way, they deceived the people. They made false issues. They handled those things that they could make a means of conclude clouding and misleading minds. And so here we have the message of righteousness by faith. Uriah Smith and the group are having a problem with Wagner, saying that you are so honest with this issue. Break the law. The second thing, you have the issue in the book of Galatians. On the other side, on one side is it is the ceremonial law. On the other side, it is the moral law. Third, you have the issue on the covenants, which Sister White says that Brother Wagner has presented the light on the covenants. And even she says, if what Brother Wagner has said is what is in the Patriarchs and Prophets, and we shall be looking at that, the covenants, as a topic, then he is in the light and we can hope in him. And so he goes ahead and tells Uriah Smith, you, Brother Dan Jones, Brother Porter, and others are spending your powers to not by investigating the position on the covenants, the light that Brother Wagner has presented is the light. And so three issues going on. Every time we hear about um, the law in Galatians being the main issue, but no, there was a host of issues in Minneapolis. And this started in the ministerial institute before they even came to the session. Again, in 1888, page 604, 605, she says, the covenant question is a clear question and will be received by every candid and prejudiced mind, but I was brought where the Lord gave me an insight into this matter. You have turned from plain light because you were afraid that the law question in Galatians will have to be accepted. As to the law in Galatians, I have no burden and never have had, and I know Brother Smith, Porter Jones, are or anyone will never be prepared to receive the light, either to establish or refute their position until every one of you are men truly converted before God. And so why are these brethren rejecting the presentation of Jonas or of Wagona on uh, the covenant? It is because they differ with him on the law in Galatians. And, uh, you know, we can go ahead, read, 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 and read what happened in uh, Minneapolis 1888, but we can look into our own eyes and investigate what is going on with us. Sometimes you find that the brethren have turned against a brother, not because what he's presenting is false, but because they have an issue with him on another doctrine. And so they will never say amen to anything he says, even though it is light, because there is something else that he may be holding that they see it in a different way. Don't think that you are doing something so new. This was the spirit that was in Minneapolis, that uh, these brethren could not accept the truth on the covenants. Why? Because they thought that Wagona was in error with the law in Galatians. And so everything that came from him was now an error. Saying to Elder 
Smith against he says now I tell you here before God that the covenant question as it has been presented is the truth. It is the light. It clear line it has been laid before me. And those that have been resisting the light, I ask you whether you, they have been working for God or for the devil. Dig in the Bible, sing the shaft of truth to find what is truth. But I tell you today, while I have been keeping in silence, the Lord has been revealing night after night the position of individual cases before me. The converting power of God is needed in our midst. He will work through our ministers as he did in Bethlehem. He will shed his light and his glory upon us if we only give him a chance. But when you begin to talk with them, they will make your words mean something else. The devil is at their side. He is just as much at their side as he was at the side of those men of Nazareth when Christ proclaimed that he was the anointed one. The power of God, the Holy Ghost, the great convictor said it was so, and they said right out it was so. But the devil said, think of this. Why? His mother and his brethren are right here with us. Well, then Satan followed up the truck. And what next? They were ready to pitch him over the precipice. It is not best to set the feet and engine the powers of darkness, but God help us right here on this ground to surrender to him. I have borne testimony after testimony, but it has not had any help you to not close your hearts and minds to this testimony. May God help you to accept and receive it as truth. And uh, the long standing in the way of the work of God as you have done is not that you have not had light and evidence, but your stubborn will like still will not give up your will and your way to God's will and God's way. Elder Smith and Butler are very loath to have anything said upon the law in Galatians, but I cannot see how it can be avoided. We must take the Bible as our standard and we must diligently search its pages for light and evidence to the truth. And lastly, to the assembled brethren, she said, the debating spirit has come into the ranks of Sabbath keepers to take the place of the spirit of God. They have placed finite men where God should be, but nothing can suffice for us but to have Christ dwell in our hearts by faith. The truth must become ours. Christ must be our savior by an experimental religion or knowledge. We should know by faith what it is to have our sins pardoned and to be born again. We must have a higher, deeper wisdom than man's to guide us amid the perils surrounding our pathway. The spirit of Christ must be in us just as the blood is in the body, circulating through it as a vitally, vitalizing power. And so, Instead of people seeking after Christ and receiving his spirit, what they have developed is a spirit of debate. Now, the spirit of debate has, uh, has, uh, has been diffused among us. It has taken the send up uh, stage in Adventism until today. That is what actually people have, a debating spirit. And uh, conclusion remarks. This meeting, in 1888, page 179, paragraph 2, she says, This meeting has been the saddest experience of my life, and yet I feel the peace of Christ sustaining me. I see that which fills my heart with very disagreeable forbiddings. I had presented before me, I had presented before me in Europe chapters in the future experience of our people which are being fulfilled during this meeting. The reason given me was, one of Bible piety and of the spirit and mind of Christ. The enemy has been placing his mold on the work for years, for it certainly is not the divine mold. That men should keep alive the spirit which ran riot at Minneapolis is an offense to God. All heaven is indignant at the spirit that for years has been revealed in our publishing institution at Battle Creek. Unrighteousness is practice that God will not tolerate. He will visit those things. A voice has been heard pointing out the errors and in the name of the Lord pleading for a decided change. But who have followed the instruction given? Who have humbled their hearts to put from them every vestige of their wicked oppressing, oppressive spirit? I have been greatly burdened to set these matters before the people as they are. I know they will see them. I know that those who read this matter will be convicted. Here is Elder Smith and Elder Van Horn who have been handling the truth for years. And yet we must not touch this subject because Elder Butler was not here. Elder Kilgo, I was grieved more than I can express to you when I heard you make that remark because I have lost confidence in you. Now we want to get right at what God says 
all this terrible feeling I don't believe in. Let us go to the Lord for the truth instead of our showing this spirit of compartedness. God has given me light and you have acknowledged it in times past. And so uh, there is uh, the shocking uh, messages that we can glean from the 1888 messages. Was the message accepted or was the message rejected? According to the last quote, where Elder Smith and Elder Kilgo and others are saying, we cannot touch on these matters unless G.I. Butler is present, Sister Wise says that this is the saddest moment of my life. Reason being this, as we pray, is that uh, the message of righteousness by faith was to lay the glory of man in dust. Men had been taught to look upon men and they needed to be pointed at the divine picture of Jesus Christ that they may receive the merits of Christ, the charms of his love, which is able to help us to obey his commandments. And so men had been taught to look at man. And that was the greatest hindrance of the accepted, acceptance of the message in 1888. May it be also today, the reason why we are not really progressing in our evangelism in our spreading the third angel's message is because men have been taught to look to man. If so and so doesn't say this thing is right, then no one accept it as right. Just the way people could not accept anything if Butler or Uriah Smith could have not accepted it. So is today. We have prominent people whom if they reject something, then it means that the whole congregation doesn't see it as right. May God save us from looking unto men because cast is a man who holds on the arm of flesh, who leans on the arm of flesh. And my prayer is that we may be delivered from the spirit of Minneapolis. And uh, may the Lord continue working in us as we go through this series that uh, we may not have just information, but we may go back to the drawing board and ask where did we go wrong and how can we rectify things and seek Christ as uh, 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 with lighted lamps for adventure that we might find him and that he may claim the sanctuary, he may have a spotless child that he can present before the Father as his bride. May we pray. Our dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that, uh, Lord, you have withheld the rain so that uh, we may be able to study again. And Lord, we want this compartiveness and uh, the spirit that existed in Minneapolis, the spirit that existed in the rejection of Jesus Christ may be taken away from us that we may behold the man Jesus Christ and say, behold our God. Thank you for every precious light that you are sending on our side and even revisiting these messages that, Lord, we may know where we are standing in time and we may know what to do for the children of Issachar, our men of understanding time, to know what Israel ought to do. And so we want also to be like those men. Help us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.